So what's up everyone and today we're going to talk about the chapter of Coast particularly Coast Gateway 1 so if you are a core geography student and you're struggling with that or you just need um, something to actually help you revise or to summarize the entire gateway and the things to look out for just stay tuned and watch all the way to the end and hopefully this uh, particular video as well as this mind map will actually help you In the chapter of coast, the first thing, in fact, every single chapter, uh, the first thing that you should look out for would be the key inquiry question. Now, why is it important to first unpack the key inquiry question? Uh, it's because this is basically the question that you will answer after you have addressed every single gateway, all the different concepts. Should coastal environments matter? So we'll come back to this question at the end of this entire series of videos. And now let's unpack the word coastal environments. Because um, many times we just assume, oh, coast means oh, we have a sandy beach. But the reality is around the world, coastal environments actually vary from place to place and at the same time, they also change over time due to all the natural coastal processes. So um, in your textbook, you will realize that they categorize them under three different processes. We have erosion, we have um, sediment transportation as well as deposition. So now, first of all, erosion. Now before we jump straight into the four different erosional processes, get your foundation right. So erosion itself is basically caused by destructive waves and basically destructive waves is caused by high wave energy which can be determined by three different factors such as the wind speed which will determine the wind energy and all this wind energy will be transferred onto the waves next will be duration of wind which is basically the longer the duration of the wind the higher the energy and of course lastly the fetch which is imagine a wide open sea that is unobstructed, the fetch is long and therefore uh, the wind can blow over a long stretch of the waters generating higher wave energy, therefore allowing destructive waves to be formed in the first place. The first thing to recognize about destructive waves would be that it has a weaker swash and a stronger backwash. Now what do I mean by stronger backwash? You just need to understand that swash brings material up to the coast and backwash removes the material from the coast. So if the swash is actually weaker than the backwash, basically the backwash is removing more materials than it is actually depositing on the coast. And therefore, since it's removing more, erosion occurs. Apart from that, when we look at all these four erosional processes, I think they're primarily applicable to clifted coastlines, right? So especially the first two, when we talk about hydraulic action, and abrasion. So imagine, I know this is a horrible drawing, when we observe a clifted coastline that's being eroded, you will notice that it's not the entire cliff that's eroded by the waves, but instead it is actually the bottom part of the cliff, the base of the cliff that's affected. So um, the waves will actually attack the cliff up to the height where the high tide level is. As the waves approach the cliff itself, you will notice that hydraulic action and abrasion will take place. So first, it will compress air into the cracks and then this will exert greater amount of pressure which will weaken the rock at the same time as the waves carry sediments in it it will actually um, smash the sediments onto the cliff surface itself which therefore results in abrasion so over time you will notice that the base of the cliff is being undercut so if the undercutting process occurs um, continuously you will notice that over time the roof of this cliff will be weakened and over time the roof of the cliff will actually collapse right so as it collapses you will notice that this entire cliff face actually retreats inland now at the same time as the cliff retreats inland all the sediments that accumulated at the base of the cliff due to the collapse this will actually result in the formation of something called a shore platform in another words some people call it the wave cut platform okay so now 
because of hydraulic action and abrasion, you get the formation of this two retreat of cliff as well as the formation of shore platform. Now, the next thing that you need to notice is that um, in your textbook, they focus on solution. Solution, or some people call it corrosion. Now, this is only applicable to specific rock types. So, one good example would be limestone cliffs. So, that's why sometimes if you look at um, some of the limestone caves, all right, you notice there is stalactites and stalagmites. So, all these are basically due to the process of solution. Alright, so if you're keen, you can read more about it, but just understand that solution is only applicable um, to certain rock types. And finally, we have attrition. Now, this itself doesn't contribute to the erosion of cliff, but more of the erosion of the rock fragments that are accumulated at the base of the cliff. So, now, imagine if hydraulic action and abrasion has occurred and a cliff has retreated in land and you have a shore platform over here. So all the rock fragments that are accumulated on the shore platform have jagged edges. So attrition will now take place whereby when it's high tide, when the waves come in, okay, it actually carries all these rock fragments and cause them to smash against each other. So during this process, all these rock fragments will now become rounder and smoother and it eventually become pebbles so that's why if you look at the long run um, pebble beach can be actually formed due to the process of attrition as well okay so now hopefully you have a better and clearer understanding of all these four erosional processes and bringing all our understanding of the process of erosion it can actually lead to retreating of coastal cliff formation of Bays. We are talking about headlands and bays, so particularly the formation of bays itself and of course the formation of caves, arcs as well as stacks. Alright, so if you are curious about this part, go and read through your text, it's actually quite straightforward. Okay, so next would be that um, under the natural coastal processes, we have the transportation of sediments. Now, when it comes to the transportation of sediments, the main thing would be how sediments actually move along a beach itself. So the process that you are focusing on is longshore drift. I think this is pretty straightforward, but you just need to recognize that there are two main criteria for longshore drift to actually occur. First, you need to have availability of sediments. Right? If there are no sediments being available at that particular side itself then of course longshore drift will occur and next would be that the waves must approach the coast at an oblique angle now um, in order for waves to approach the coast at an oblique angle you need to have prevailing winds that are approaching the coast at an oblique angle as well and therefore the sediments can move in a zigzag manner Right, can you imagine the waves are actually approaching the coast in a parallel manner? What you will notice is that the sediments, they will move up the coast, they will move down the coast. Therefore, there is no longshore drift that's occurring over there. Okay, so now when it comes to deposition, um, it's basically a reverse of erosion. Now we have constructive waves whereby the swash is stronger than a backwash. What is being deposited is actually more than what is being removed. And therefore, over time you notice there's accumulation of sediments. So most of the time, you will result in the formation of a beach as well as formation of spits and tombolos. Now, spits and tombolos got to do with longshore drift. I think this is something that's pretty clear cut as well. If there is a sudden change in um, the coastline, you will notice that longshore drift it continues in the same direction, and therefore, as the sediments accumulate at the base of the seafloor, and once it reaches above um, water level, it forms a spit. And if it continues and it connects to another island, then it forms a tombolo. I guess this part is pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> okay. So finally. If we go back uh, to what we've mentioned previously about formation of bays, in order to understand headlands and bays, we need to tie in to the main idea of the geology of the particular uh, coastline itself. So what does geology mean? We are focusing on two things, the composition of rocks as well as the arrangement of rocks. Now. Arrangement of rocks can come in the form of alternate bands of more resistant and less resistant rocks. So when I talk about more resistant and less resistant, I'm actually referring to the composition. So if you have a combination of both, all right, this will actually lead to the formation of headlands and bays. So now, just to quickly clarify, when we talk about 
more and less resistant rocks, common misconception is that there are different rock types. Yes, that's a possibility, but the most common thing that you will notice along coastlines would be that um, that particular stretch of coastline is just made up of a single type of rock. Then why is there headlands and bays? Now this is due to the different amounts of lines of weaknesses on the rock itself. Basically, for instance, if you have a stretch of coastline and this particular stretch has more lines of weaknesses uh, or basically it's more well jointed, therefore it's actually less resistant. Okay, as compared to another section which is also the same rock type but it has less lines of weaknesses therefore it's more resistant and over time due to the coastal process of erosion you will notice you will get the formation of headlands and bays. Okay, so headlands and bays eventually over time they will also be subjected to another process called wave refraction now wave refraction remember it only occurs after headlands and bays are formed so when waves approach a coast in a parallel manner right if there is a protruding headland basically this will result in the bending of the waves itself so during this process of wave refraction more of the wave more wave energy will be focused on the headland and therefore it promotes the erosion of the headland whereas by the time it reaches the bay um, the wave energy is now more dispersed and therefore it reduces in wave energy and which results in um, constructive waves being formed and therefore it promotes deposition and that's why over time you notice some of the bays they get a lot of sediments accumulated and you get a very nice sheltered beach itself so in the long run if wave refraction keeps occurring on um, a coastline with headlands and bays you can imagine decades or centuries later you will notice that the particular stretch of coastline will now uh, eventually become straightened because the headlands are eroding whereas the bays are experiencing deposition so over time it balances out and straightens the coastline but that will take a long time so it can be decades it can be centuries all right so i hope this whole mind map can actually help you better understand the chapter of coast particularly the foundation um, of coast itself uh, which is in gateway one and once you understand this gateway two and three will be much easier and you'll be better equipped to answer this inquiry question okay so i hope this video is pretty useful to all of you who are doing your revision and i'll see you tomorrow Hopefully, um, really busy recently, but um, I'll try and get Gateway 2 and Gateway 3's mind map out and we'll see each other then. All the best. See ya.